welcome you here tonight. Um, this is the embassy's first culture salon um, and also the first of our Sing 150 season to celebrate the 150th birth year of JM Singh. Uh, absolutely honored to have such distinguished guests tonight, uh, Dr. Catherine Wilston and Declan Kybird. Um, it's really very, very special to have them for our inaugural Culture Salon. Uh, the Embassy are also delighted to be co-hosting tonight's event with the General Consulate in Frankfurt. Um, of course, J.M. Singh was, is also very, very important uh, as he spent some time in Koblenz. Um, so it's, it's a pleasure to be working with our colleagues in Frankfurt tonight as well. Um, so before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to hand over to Ambassador Dr. Nicholas O'Brien to say a few words to open. Ambassador. Great. Thanks very much, Candice. And, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's great to see so, so, such a, a wonderful number of people here this evening. Um, you know, I, I was just saying earlier on that uh, you know, traditionally we would do these events in the embassy and, you know, we would get a very good crowd. And, and one of the, uh, you know, it's very hard to see many upsides of the pandemic, but I think one of them is that we're, we're, we're reaching out to a much broader audience uh, and that's to be encouraged and, and, and that's great. And this is something we're certainly very conscious of in terms of going forward, how we preserve the traditional uh, you know, let's call it the traditional function. Plus, we also kind of tap into the broad, broader audience uh, across Germany. Um, they're really delighted to welcome you to, to tonight's colloquium on John Millington Singh. And it's, as, as Candice was saying, this is the inaugural event of our new Culture Salon series. Um, and this is an exciting new development as we continue to expand our range of cultural engagement across Germany. Uh, particularly delighted, we have two distinguished academics with us this evening um, on this field, um, they, they probably need no introduction, Declan Kybert and Dr. Catherine Wilson. They're both known for their expertise on Irish literature, and they're going to give us a, an insight into Singh's life, his travels across Europe, and the inspiration he found in Germany that fed into his much celebrated and his, his deeply important work in, in the lexicon of Irish literature. The work of Singh made a deep impression on Irish culture for well over 100 years, and it's celebrated and honoured, but at the time it also left some audiences scandalised, and for this reason, I think tonight's uh, talks are going to be really interesting. Um, you know, he, he was not, not uh, an author with, without controversy at the time. While he was steeped in traditional Irish culture, he was also influenced by the time he spent in Germany, and particularly German opera. So Singh, in a sense, is an exemplary of the richness and the complexity of the Irish arts, crossing between opera, music, and, and literature. He was drawn to Germany with the hopes of becoming a musician. And I think we're probably grateful that things didn't go quite as planned for him. And he turned instead to writing so that we can today enjoy and be inspired by the great works all these years later. Now, perhaps it took the perspective of an artist who had traveled, who spent some time living in Koblenz and Würzburg to then write about his own country in such a powerful manner that moved so many with an enduring impact. And could I just say as an aside, I'm delighted to see so many from Würzburg here this evening. I can see Matthias Fleckenstein, Maria Eisenmann and Ina Bergman from the Irish Studies of Würzburg uh, joining us this evening. The inspiration that Germany gave to sing and to so many other Irish artists has fed back into Irish culture and as an expression of the benefits of cultural exchange. His connection with Germany is only part of a long history that the two countries share, but it is so much value that we examine it deeply and celebrate it here this evening. As I said, uh, tonight is, 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 is in a sense the first of our culture salon, but it's also one, it's also the first of a series of events of our Sing 150 season, as we commemorate the life of Singh, one of Ireland's most influential playwrights. And we're very proud to host this event along with our colleagues in Frankfurt this evening. The celebration presents us with a great opportunity to view our cultural heritage as it relates to Germany, where so many young Irish artists now call home. We can see the value of partnership, not only in the sense of what Irish artists can bring to Germany, but also how they are enriched by their experiences here today. So, 
Without further ado, I really hope you enjoy this evening's offering and you find it inspiring and illuminating. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, so I'm going to uh, invite the first speaker, uh, Dr. Catherine Wilson, to, uh, to present her lecture on Singh. Um, Dr. Catherine Wilson has a PhD in English literature from UCD. Her research was focused on J.M. Singh's travels in Europe. She manages international programs and lectures in Irish literature at the University of Notre Dame, and she has lectured at various third level institutions, including UCD. Hello, Catherine. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Candice. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here with you, and hopefully this works. Um, mostly sharing my screen so that you don't see my lockdown hair. Um, can you see that? Okay, I'm just going to play from start. Sorry, just one moment. Did that work? Sorry. Here we go. Yeah. So good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Ambassador O'Brien, for those remarks, um, and Candice and the consulate, the team, the consul team for this kind invitation tonight. Um, it's a privilege to have this opportunity to speak to um, an audience based in Germany about Singh's time there. Um, and also, and even more so, really to have the privilege of speaking alongside my, uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Declan Kybert. Singh is well known, as Ambassador O'Brien pointed out, as the author of the Playboy, The Western World, and for the controversies around that play. Um, he's also well known as author of Riders to the Sea, and one of the first directors of the Abbey Theatre, alongside Lady Gregory and W.B. Yeats. The story of his career at the Abbey, in particular the Playboy riots, is familiar to most. This evening, however, I'm going to bring you back to before he was famous. I'm going to talk a little bit about Singh's life in Germany and break it down into three parts. So first of all, I'll cover the basics, how he came to be there, where he visited, who he met and what he did there. Next, I'll consider his artistic development during this time, charting his move from music to literature. And also I'll be discussing um, the influence of folk culture during this time. Finally, I'll look at how travel and the practice of translation for Singh contributed to a process of self-becoming that continued when he left Germany and laid the foundations for further developments in France. Singh graduated from Trinity College Dublin with a bachelor's degree at the age of 22. He followed a course of study intended for students of divinity, which included Hebrew, Latin, Greek and Irish. So you can already see that he was becoming a linguist at this point. His passion, however, lay in music, and his diaries show that he spent much time practicing the violin, attending music recitals and concerts at the Royal Irish Academy of Music, operas at Leinster Hall, and theatre at the Gaiety. Music was the primary motivation for his trip to Germany, but letters from his mother revealed that he was unhappy at home and had trouble controlling his temper. Of course, any student living at home at this in their early 20s would be eager to break free, but the gap between Singh's desires and the expect expectations of his devout upper middle class family was widening. Mrs. Singh, reconciling herself with the fact that her youngest would never become a clergyman, agreed to send him to Germany under the guidance of a cousin, Mary Helena Singh. His first steps towards self-determination would be watched carefully by several women in his life. Based in England, Mary Helena was a concert pianist and a music teacher. She joined Singh in London at the end of July 1893, before they set sail for the Hook of Holland. They travelled via Cologne to the town of Koblenz, right, to the town of Koblenz on the banks of the Rhine, where they lodged with the von Eichen family on the small island of Oberwerth. The Protestant von Eichen sisters provided a safe intermediary between the Singh home and the world of professional musicians. This was a more relaxed household than home, and Singh quickly became friendly with Valeska von Eichen, the youngest of the seven sisters. Singh later characterised his time in Germany as partly a holiday. And when, he began, when we begin to think of the kind of travel that he engaged in, his diaries certainly portray the posture of a tourist at times. He visited the castles at Stosenfell and Laneck, the forts at Asterstein and Arianbreitstein, 
and he regularly took long solitary walks or drive, drives across the region, traveling to Bingen on the banks of the Rhine and to Heidelberg to visit the Konigstuhl. It's little wonder that by August, according to his diary, he had to replace the soles of his shoes. Exploring the countryside by foot and jotting down lines of verse in his notebooks, Singh followed in the, romantic foot, in the footsteps of romantic poets such as Wordsworth and Coleridge, both of whom had toured the region um, in 1828. So you can see here, which is very familiar, I'm sure, to those of you in Germany, the, the romantic road kind of tourist trail. The fact that he had developed a passion for antiquities in Trinity, as well as immersing himself in romantic literature, means that this may have been more of a pilgrimage than a, a superficial tourist trip. W.B. Yeats once described this period of Singh's life, pointing to the way in which he engaged with the people who inhabited the Bavarian countryside. He wrote, and I quote, before I met him in Paris, he had wandered over much of Europe listening to stories in the Black Forest, making friends with servants and with poor people, and this from an aesthetic interest, for he had gathered no statistics, had no money to give, and cared nothing for the wrongs of the poor, being content to pay for the pleasure of eye and ear with a tune upon the fiddle." Unquote. Bavarian folk life and the music of Franz Schubert and Robert Schumann in particular formed the central cultural nexus of his experience in Germany. At the end of 1894, Singh moved to Würzburg, where he continued to study music and gradually began to display literary ambitions that would eventually lead him to Paris the following year. He took piano lessons there and lodged in a guest house recommended von, by the von Eikens. So he was still within this kind of um, sphere of, of uh, middle-class Protestant culture um, and, and with, within the, the sites of home really. Letters reveal that he was lonely and missed the company of his sisters, in particular, Valeska, with whom he had uh, become close. The discovery of and fascination with folk culture was widespread across Europe during the 19th century, and the vibrant folk movement developed in, in Germany with particular emphasis on music. Opera, as Ambassador Brian pointed out in particular, was central to the formation of national identity. In fact, Würzburg emerged as a center for folk studies during this period. And in the same year uh, that Singh re relocated there, the Association for Bavarian St Folk Studies and Dialect Research was founded in the city. Whether or not Singh was aware of this, I can't be sure, but it points to the importance of folk culture in the region at the time. Singh returned to Koblenz in March before traveling back to Ireland in, in June to spend the summer with his family in Wicklow. His last time in Germany was at the end of 1894, where he returned to spend Christmas with the von Eikens before moving to Paris in 1895 to take up the study, the study of language and literature. So we'll move on now to consider um, his development as an artist at the time. When he wasn't wandering the Bavarian countryside, practicing or composing music, Singh attended various concerts and operas, including Mozart's The Magic Flute, Verdi's Rigoletto, Weber's um, Der Freischutz, and uh, Beethoven's Fidelio. The combination of vi the visual power of theater and the emotional effects of music in opera was attractive to Singh. In his autobiographical essay, he wrote of the particular harmony or collective feeling experienced while playing in an orchestra. He wrote, the collective passion produced by a band working together with one will and ideal is unlike any other exaltation. No other emotion that I've received was quite so puissant or complete. A slight and altogether subconscious avidity of sex wound and wreathed itself in the extraordinary beauty of the movement. Not unlike the sexual element that exists in all really fervent ecstasies of faith." Unquote. In describing the collective passion of the musicians, he refers to the direct um, access that music affords the subconscious. His comments recall Arthur Schopenhauer, who thought that music alone speaks um, a language immediately intelligible to each of us without the mediation of intellectual conceptions. It is therefore a higher form of art when compared to poetry or the plastic arts, both of which require conscious construction. This echoes Schopenhauer's essay, The Will as, sorry, The World as Will and Representation, which Singh would have read alongside Wagner's essay on Beethoven, 
he read these in preparation for his trip to Germany. No doubt then too, he would have been familiar with Wagner's assertion about the power of music to unify, not, not merely all men and women. In the same essay, Sing indirectly compares his youthful intoxication with nationalism with that of music. Of course, music was central to the pro promotion or development of nationalism in Germany and in particular folk music. There was a sense of the so-called primitive folk mind that had access to this um, organic genius and that the folk population had more in common with the artistic genius. This trope was mirrored elsewhere, notably in Ireland through the works of Sing and Yeats. Opera combined the emotional power of music and the directness and immediacy of drama and was therefore a powerful instrument of nationalism in 19th century Europe. In her book, um, Folklore and Nationalism in Europe, Christina Lejose writes that opera became a major site for the expression of cultural nationalism. People did not start a revolution after reading a poem or a novel, but some up uprisings actually did begin in theatres and opera houses. One is reminded here of Victor Hugo's maxim that in the theatre, the mob becomes a people and obvious parallels can be made between the effects of opera in Germany and that of theatre in the, in the early part of the 20th century in Ireland. One may even wonder, as Ambassador uh, O'Brien hinted, if Singh had persisted and developed as a composer, would he have contributed to an Irish operatic tradition? In an Irish context, the ballad form fuses word and music similar to the German folk song or Volkslied, but, was, but the ballad was never fully assimilated into operatic com compositions in the same manner as it was in Germany. The Volkslieder or folk song uh, reflected regional dialects often describing local landscapes and traditions, connecting language and place, contributing to the sense of shared national identity. Composers such as Schubert and Schumann worked to achieve perfect balance of word and tone, setting the music, setting to music the works of writers like Goethe, Schiller, Eichendorff, and Hein. Described as a kind of democratized opera, Volkslieder were inspired by the lives and language of the rural peasantry and re representative of what Herder called the Volksgeist or folk spirit, born out of a shared language and ideals. 19th century audiences were drawn to the theatricality and accessibility of the mode. Where opera took place in a theatre, Volkslieder were performed in the home. Where opera employed orchestra, Volkslieder required only piano and voice. Where costumes contributed to operatic expression, Volkslieder expressed colour in, in sound. And where operas were performed by companies, one or two artists only were, were required to perform Volkslieder. Therefore, the folk song enabled people to, to participate in the drama of opera, but on a smaller scale in their own home. This confluence of music and poetry appealed to Singh and his notebooks reveal his own attempts at verse during this time. Indeed, Ballad of a Pauper, the first evidence of Singh's efforts at folk dialect, was written during his time in Germany. Poems written during his stay at Würzburg display an interest in folk subjects. For example, a ballad about a singer trying to connect with the local peasantry. And um, there's one about expression, expressing homesickness or nostalgia, um, which can be compared to the, the German um, phenomenon of Heimweh. Um, and also just dealing with the struggles of being in a, in a foreign land. His, his jottings kind of re represent this. The German, the common German folk trope, trope of a, a poet condemned to wander the world appears in these jottings and the loneliness and isolation expressed by the speaker recall Schubert's folks leader. For example, the poetic cycles of Wilhelm Müller, uh, Winter Rise and Die Schöne Müllerin, which describe wandering strangers who arrive in a new place only to fall in love with a local maiden. The stranger's love is rebuffed, forcing him to leave the village and continue to wander the countryside. The loneliness expressed in Singh's verse emerges as the speaker tries to capture the Volksgeist, but is frustrated by his inability to fully gain access to the folk experience. The way in which he engages with otherness tells us something about the type of travel Singh is engaged in. As Johannes Evelyn points out in Exiles Travelling. Framed as an imperative of so solitary mobile learning, real travel is ultimately an ethical act 
as it draws its legitimacy from enabling genuine encounters with otherness. Those who are attentive to the alterity to which travel exposes them have heeded the inherent call for the engagement between self and environment. Singh's drafts demonstrate attempts at real travel through genuine encounters, but he was thwarted by a perspective that was imitative, or at least not genuine to himself and his experience. In Germany, he may have identified the folk subject as a site through which to channel his creative genius, but he had not yet de developed fitting narratives, uh, narrative strategies uh, to deal with it. So I'll move on to the final part of the presentation, which um, I'll talk a little bit about his engagement with drama and translation. As previously mentioned, from time to time, he attended the theatre or opera, um, but it was through the Von Eichen sisters in Oberwerth that he became involved in amateur productions and, and tableau vivant or live paintings. Included among these was a live painting of a gypsy camp scene, a medieval scene, um, and scenes also from the Grimm brothers Snow White. In a letter to Singh in Paris, Valeska lamented his absence from recent productions, including a scene from Heinrich von Kleist's Battle of Teutoburg Tut Forest, um, which was based on a nationalist myth. It's not surprising then that in Würzburg, he began sketching um, his first idea for a play, which was a three act piece set in rural Ireland. The hero, a clever young man, is fed up with London life and wishes to escape to a rural setting. It's a tale of an unconventional love match between the urbane hero and a simple cottage girl who symbolizes um, a return to an authentic rural past. Again, we see these kind of common tropes reappearing. It's important to note that Singh also demonstrated an interest in modern theatre at this time, and we know that his first encounters with the work of Heinrich Ibsen was during this day, his day at Oberwerth, when he read um, a number of Ibsen's plays in German trans translation. Later encounters with Ibsen's work in the avant-garde uh, theatres of Paris instilled in Singh uh, a view of how theatre could provoke an audience into self-reflection. And indeed, one of his later plays, Shadow of the Glen, was branded Irish Ibsenite propaganda. His involvement in the Tableau Vivant, however, demonstrates involvement in a, in a civic-minded folk movement, marked by the popularization of these folk tales. Though the Tableau enabled him to play at being a folk character for a short time, it was through translation that he attempted to inhabit the minds and lives of others, poet and subject. Like travel, translation offers new ways of seeing and new ways of interpreting. The translator inhabits an intermediary space between cultures. Singh continued to translate poems and ballads throughout his life and later gained a more confident voice. Translating writers like, such as Lepardi, uh, Petrarch, Villon and Van Vogelweid into Irish dialect enabled him to inhabit the lives of others and filter their voices into the language of another group which was inaccessible to him. The process of learning new languages offers individuals an opportunity to attain a certain internal freedom as it distances them from their mother tongue. To be able to write, one needs psychological space. In Germany, Singh achieved this phys the physical distance from the familiar sites of home and psychological space through language learning. Multilingualism provides space to begin the process of finding one own, one's own creative voice and thereby a sense of selfhood. By learning German and later French Ita and Italian and even a little Breton, Singh gradually pulled away from the constraints of both his mother tongue and an inexpressive, God-fearing mother. Germany represented an adventure beyond the familiar where he could begin to for forge a new identity in a manner reminiscent of Christy Mahon escaping the tyranny of his father to become the champion playboy of the Western world. Finally, I'm going to just draw together some of these points by returning to the question of what exactly was the nature of Singh's travel. Can we, for example, compare him to his, his time that spent there on the continent to the experiences of Joyce and Beckett? At a time when voluntary exile became almost a precondition of the modernist artist, can Singh be cast as a self-styled writer in exile? Or was he simply a gentleman partaking in the 19th century so-called travel to grow phenomenon? My answer would be characteristically academic and characteristically Singian in that it's somewhere in between. Though Singh's 
uh, European excursions do not fit, fit classical definitions of you know, the, the exile traveling or the exilic travel, all travel involves elements of exile to some extent. As the individual is forced to deal with strangeness, a sense of loss and alienation, experiences that are ultimately transformative, either positively or negatively. The experience of departing from the familiar, homesickness and isolation often lead to interesting discoveries about oneself. As American travel writer Paul Theroux points out, travel has less to do with distance than with insight. It is very often a way of seeing. Travel entails not just a physical journey out into the world, but also an inward journey. Singh left Dub Dublin, a troubled man, struggling to with a love lost, religious doubt, and the pressure of familial and class expectations, as well as struggles with artistic expression. Germany provided not only physical distance from the constraints of a conservative household, but also a new language through which he could achieve psychological space exposure to a folk culture in a foreign land, which enabled a comparative perspective. Literary models such as the poet Wanderer, which he could inhabit in a way that perhaps facilitated the working out of some of his own anxieties. It also enabled a development of his emotional maturity through music and through his friendship with Valeska. Finally, it enabled a freedom to begin the process of self-creation or self-fashioning. During this time, he decided to give up his ambitions to become a music, uh, professional musician, feeling that German composers would always be superior. Singh would have further journeys to make before he would become the central figure of the Irish cultural revival as we know him today. And in January 1895, he went to Paris, as he described to a friend, to be quiet and to wear dirty clothes if he liked. It's clear that already the seeds of his countercultural perspective were emerging at this time, a perspective that, as we now know, would land him in controversy upon his return to Ireland. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, and folks, uh, just please remember to, uh, you can send in your questions into the chat box. So if anything came up uh, there in Catherine's lecture that you'd like to uh, follow up on, you can send it into the chat box and then we'll uh, visit the questions during the Q&A after our next speaker. Um, and so named as one of the public figures leading our cultural discourse by The Observer, Declan Kybird is a literary historian and critic and his area of specialization is Irish literature of the 20th century. He is Professor of Irish Studies and Professor of English at the University of Notre Dame and was previously lecturer of Anglo-Irish Literature at UCD. He is widely acknowledged as an expert on Irish literature and writers who write in Gaelic and he has authored many highly praised seminal works on Irish culture including Inventing Ireland, The Literature of a Modern Nation, Idir Gaw Kultur, and uh, most relevant for tonight's lecture, Sing and the Irish Language. I'm very, very happy to welcome to the Culture Salon tonight, Declan Kybird. Thank you so much, Candice, for having me. And I want to thank Catherine for that very brilliant lecture. And it made me think in a way that uh, you can't know your own country until you've been outside of it for a while. And that's what Singh was partly doing. I think he, he wasn't a full-time exile so much as someone who was trying to get a, a measure of Ireland. And I can't, I can't help thinking that um, in many ways, German people invented Ireland. If you think of uh, you know, the scholarship that made the Irish revival possible, it's by people like Kuno Meyer, by Zimmer, um, and in more recent times, we've had Wittgenstein living in the west of Ireland, Heinrich Böll keeping the diary in Ackel. It's an amazing story of how, a bit like what Catherine was saying about Singh there, German people coming to Ireland in order to maybe uncover a part of themselves that was hidden at home and which can only be unleashed in the foreign place. But also maybe, as Catherine was saying, trying to escape the uh, constrictions 
of identity initially imposed on them. Um, I, I would say that in many ways there wouldn't have been an Irish revival but for the work of those German scholars and some of their French counterparts too, about whom I'll speak a bit. Um, the, the German interest in folk song and folk tale, as Catherine was saying, alerted Singh, I think, to many of the elements in the culture he would find in his home place in, in Gaelic Ireland. But I think it also alerted him to something within himself, that his was a genius for translation. Uh, Catherine mentioned how those early poems he wrote, uh, they were okay, but they were a little bit stiff and correct and proper. They really were two rather than three dimensional. But when Singh starts translating from another language, whether it's German or whether it's Irish, you get the full sense of the Singh song, the man himself at full throttle. And he may have had some almost proleptic sense of this, uh, even when he was staying with the von Eikens, um, because he seems to me to have had a crush on Valeska von Eiken, and he used Irish in his diary uh, to record his feelings about her. And I'm sure he did this because he knew damned well that his mother might likely snoop read his diaries when he brought them home. And so to avoid that, he, uh, he, 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 he wrote words in Irish. It's a kind of secret language uh, uh, expressing kind of youthful passion. He also wrote in Irish in his diaries when he submitted um, a poem to Father Matthew Russell's Irish Review, uh, Irish Monthly rather. And this was a journal, uh, this was quite a precocious thing for Singh to do. He was still a teenager when he did it. So you have this idea of sex and art being his secret worlds, which maybe get expressed through the Irish language. Um, he also fell in love with a woman, a cousin of his named Alice Owen. And um, he writes about her in Irish, uh, in, in the diaries, Honic May Alice, I saw Alice, or Dimig Alice, Ochon Ochon. Um, this is the sort of wording he uses about Valeska von Eichen. Um, uh, the, the, the words in the diaries in 1894, 1895 are usually lamenting the fact that he will soon be separated from her. And she seemed to sense it because she wrote to him and said, nothing can destroy our friendship. Time and the future will only enhance it. Um, but he gave up, as Catherine said, the idea of a musical career. I think because of his shyness, he, he just couldn't perform in public. Brendan Kennelly once brilliantly described Singh as the watcher in the shadows. He was someone who wanted to observe rather than be center stage. And uh, he has that in common with Joyce, you know, a great potential musical performer, lost to music, but recaptured by Irish literature instead. And if you look at Singh's prompt books in um, the Abbey Theater, the prompt books of his plays, you find that he often scored them literally as, if you like, operas. Catherine was talking about the operatic element. Uh, so you get beside a speech, the word like andante or pizzicato or allegro. And um, he did actually write or begin an opera on the theme of Eileen Arun, which is an old Gaelic song. And I've often felt that there is an operatic element in Irish theatre. W. H. Auden, the poet, said that about Wilde, that what he produced were really verbal operas. And it's a tradition that goes right down to Tom Murphy and the Geely concert, which is a play about an opera singer. Um, all these travels, as Catherine said, uh, gave Singh a wealth of cult cultural comparison, cultural reference. Um, but I think they also did something else. They freed him from his social class back in Ireland. Um, he was born into the minor aristocracy, but he found himself by temperament a radical. And he said to his nephew, Ned Stevens, um, that a radical is someone who wants to change things root and branch, and I'm a radical. So some of this radicalism comes to him from the folk art. 
Um, but it also, I think, comes from a sense of being an intellectual and making these free comparisons uh, between one culture and uh, another. Um, I think that Singh developed that comparative method that Catherine has hinted at in his time uh, in Paris. He went to the great lectures of Darbois de Joubanville, who compared the Celtic sagas with uh, the lore of ancient Greece. And um, even in little ways, he, he made comparisons. In the notebooks he kept, for instance, he wrote that the Gaelic word for dirty, salach, S-A-L-A-C-H, was like the French word sale, S-A-L-E. And he was often the only student in Joubanville's lectures, and he would give the Irish modern pronunciation of a word that the professor had used. Um, I think he was a kind of early professor of comparative literature. Um, he, he kept noticing, for instance, how the words in Munster Irish were very like words in French. Garçon, the word for a boy, like garçon. Um, but he ultimately, ultimately, he had no long-term ambitions as a scholar. Uh, his real desire was what Catherine was talking about, to unleash this personality that somehow lay coiled and trapped within himself. Um, Yeats told him to go to the Aran Islands and express a life that had never found expression. Now, Yeats meant by that that the islands had not been expressed, which was absolute rubbish. They had been expressing themselves in Irish for centuries. But if Yeats meant that Singh's own life had not found expression, that was a brilliant observation. And going to Aran allowed Singh to do that. Um, Wilde once said that if you give a person a mask, they will always tell you the truth. And I think that was what happened to Singh when he translated. Um, he, the translator is a character in search of an author. And when the translator finds the right author, the right language, the translator liberates not just the author without, but the author within. And this is really what happened to Singh when he heard Irish spoken all around him in the West. Um, but I think what he found most of all was um, that the life on Aaron reminded him of old timers in Paris who had told him about the French Commune of 1870-71. And what that life had was a freedom from the cash nexus, uh, a life where the work of people changed with the seasons and made versatile personalities. And there wasn't any distinction made between art and craft. You just did a thing as beautifully as you could if you were making a chair or singing a song. And there were even boats in which one of the fishermen sang to the other men to make the work go more pleasantly. And the pamputi boots that the fishermen made were like the shoes made for themselves by the members of uh, the Parisian Commune in 1871. So my view of the Aran Islands is it's a left-wing pastoral. Um, it's a kind of anarchist vision, which would inspire many later radicals who wrote about Western Irish islands. People like George Thompson, who inspired, um, inspired Murder So Sulawan to write Fehablianic Foss, 20 years of growing. Um, and indeed, I'm sure that Heinrich Bell was thinking of that tradition, which goes back through people like Padre O'Donnell, uh, and Robin Flower. Um, Catherine mentioned, and so did the ambassador, the playbill of the Western world. And the central idea of that, I think Singh got, of course, from the Islanders, but also from Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde once said that crime doesn't bring the police, the police cause crime. And this is what someone said to Singh on Aaron. If a man has killed his father and is obviously broken with remorse. They can see no reason why he should be dragged away and killed by the law. It's that idea that Kierkegaard had, you're punished not so much for your sin, but by your sin, by the knowledge that you've done this thing. Such a man, the Aaron Islanders told Singh, will be quiet for the rest of his life. And if you suggest that punishment is needed as an example, they ask, would any man kill his father if he was able to help it? So this is like, the years just after Freud and the Oedipus complex has been defined in terms of modern psychology. Singh adds, some time ago, 
before the introduction of the police, all the people of the islands were as innocent as the people of Inish Man are to this day. And this is, of course, exactly in accordance with Wilde's anarchist philosophy in The Soul of Man Under Socialism. The less punishment, the less crime. Where there is no punishment at all, crime will either cease to exist, or if it occurs, it will be treated as a minor illness uh, to be cured by care and kindness. Um, and Wilde said what I think Singh believed, that the violence inflicted by the weak was far less distressing than the violence inflicted by officialdom, by the strong. Um, I think these ideas got triggered in Singh by a set of lectures he went to in Paris by Sebastian Faure on the subject of anarchism. At the time he said they were slightly silly, but I think they took hold of him when he saw their inner truth behind them laid out before him on the Aran Islands. And I think that the playboy of the Western world, even though it's not actually set on the islands, projects all those values. Uh, and it projects, uh, in a way, a kind of pleasing return to the Parisian world of self-becoming that Singh had encountered uh, among the intellectuals of Paris. Um, the Playboy, we know, is a source for Artaud's theatre of cruelty. Um, it's also a source for the existentialism of Jean-Paul Sartre. There's an amazing account in the um, autobiography of Simone de Beauvoir, Memoirs of a Dutiful Daughter, how she was dragged reluctantly again and again and again by Jean-Paul Sartre to look at performances of the playboy of the Western world and to do so in order to learn the art of self-becoming. Is it me? Is it me? Um, Singh's plays were put on in Germany in his own lifetime. And I think they've had a huge influence on the modernist culture of continental Europe, not just on Sartre, not just on Artaud, but on Brecht, who actually came to see the Playboy. And in this, I'm not sure I agree with him, but it's a valid reading, I suppose. He came to see the Playboy as a parable of proletarian insurrection against the forces of repression. And I'll end with his point, but the Playboy is one of those wonderful works that you can apply it in almost any culture and translate it into its terms. Singh wasn't just a translator, he was the enabler of translation in others. So for instance, in the 1980s, Mustafa Matura does a Playboy of the West Indies. And then more recently, back in the Abbey, Roddy Doyle and Beezy Adigon set the Playboy in Tala, in a working class district of Dublin and link it to, if you like, the realities of Tiger Ireland. Um, and of course, what happens is an almighty row, not a riot, but in the end, what amounts to a legal dispute between the two authors, Doyle and Adigon, as to which of them is the true author. On the night of the original Playboy, there were people shouting, kill the author. On the night of the modern Abbey Playboy, people would have shouted that, but they couldn't work out who exactly the author was. And it brings me back to that quote that Catherine put up, which is so lovely. Um, all art, Singh believed, was collaborative. Um, Catherine mentioned that in terms of the musical ensemble, but Singh saw that in terms of the three A's, the artist, the actor, and the audience. And I think in his own way, he did fulfill the musical visions that Catherine outlined. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Declan, uh, for such a fabulous lecture and also Catherine, such great um, complimentary sort of insights into J.M. Singh. And it's, it's such an honor to have you both speak tonight. Um, there's a couple of comments or questions. There's one question and one comment in the chat box. Um, and if anybody else has more questions, do put them in. Um, firstly, just to say Peter Dietsch of the Deutsche Irische Gesellschaft in Bonn has uh, mentioned that if anyone is interested in learning more, um, they have an exhibition on uh, later this year 
Um, it's an exhibition of his photographies uh, that he made, that Singh made at the beginning of the 20th century in the Wicklow and in Wicklow and in the Aran Islands. Um, so the information is there in the chat box and you can read more about it um, and contact him for more information. Um, so the first question of the evening um, is from Niall Farrell. Uh, this is to Catherine. Uh, I'm curious to find out if Singh's ability to relate to people changed later in life. Catherine mentioned that he somewhat struggled to relate to people when traveling because of his limited experience in life. Did this change over time, particularly through his illness? Um, thanks, Niall. Um, it's a really interesting question um, and there's kind of different layers to it, I suppose. Uh, it's interesting that you, you pick up on his illness as a possible um, uh, answer to that. Um, I suppose it did, it did change his, his, there's two answers I suppose really in that his, the way in which he related to people on a personal kind of level I'm sure did, did change um, but it, his perspective also as an author looking at uh, and, and studying um, a, a folk subject also shifted and I think um, that's what I try to kind of get across in, in my own work um, is that, you know, in Germany, we see him trying to kind of figure it out a little bit and it's and it is imitative somewhat of, uh, you know, other romantic authors or of the Volksleader um, and he's trying very much so to um, clear his throat in a way um, as, as an author, but he doesn't quite get there. Um, what we see when he leaves Germany is that he goes to Paris as um, Declan explained and he, he learns more about um, comparative philology, about um, comparative anthropology, uh, ethnography as well and just the different modes and also at this time um, ethnography is kind of changing uh, and the perspectives are changing from uh, a kind of look at the, the primitive folk subject in a very romantic way to a more modernist kind of aesthetic. Sinead Garrigan Matar is somebody who's written about this um, in her book on Yeats and Singh. And looking more so at the kind of, rather than seeing the primitive as a, a very romantic idealized subject, seeing it more and looking more so, paying attention to the, the brutal kind of elements and uh, the sexual elements um, of the primitive subject. So there's a shift kind of in the dynamic there, which changes his perspective somewhat. Um, but interestingly in the Aran Islands, that anxiety about not being able to ever fully kind of relate to uh, the Islanders is repeated. So I find that interesting that that's, you know, in the, his, jottings and his little verse that he, he he writes in his notebooks in Germany but then you see it emerge again with the Aran Islanders subject so there are still those anxieties and what I think that tells us is that he's very attentive to his position and um, we talk a lot about our positionality now when we're looking at various subjects and he is somebody who is at attentive to his position as um, you know an upper middle class educated um, male in this uh, society and he, he's not shying away from the fact that he's different. He's not pretending to be um, an Islander. He, he is very cognizant of his difference. Um, in terms of his illness, um, it's an interesting proposition and, and perhaps it did, you know, make him more uh, sympathetic. Um, but I think he was, I, I would vouch to say he was always a sympathetic kind of um, onlooker um, in many ways, but perhaps yes, his, his illness contributed to that. Could, could I just add a footnote to that, Catherine? I agree with everything you've just said. But I think um, as he got older, he became more sociable with women and more confident in what he had to say in conversations with them. Um, it, apparently, when he was dying in the Elpis nursing home, he tried to convert some of the nurses with whom he became friendly to the cause of feminism. You remember that? And I, I, it's such a great image, this poor guy dying, you know, in his late 30s, but trying to convince these nice young nurses that they should all be suffragists. So he must have had a, a certain confidence in the end, and maybe the illness helped to bring it out. Thank you. Um, so any more questions to be posed to Catherine or Declan? 
Can I just uh, jump in on the um, phot photography exhibition just to say I note that um, one of my former colleagues in UCD, Julia Bruna, is on the um, Zoom and not to call it <laughs> call her, her to contribute, but uh, just to say that she's written a wonderful book on um, Singh's travel writings and um, she also analyzes his photography. So um, it would be a wonderful compliment to that exhibition. Um, and so just to mention Julia's book. Great, um, that's fabulous. Um, so, well, if there's no more questions, oh, there is a question. Uh, Matthias Fleckenstein asks, I think there might be a pattern in Koblenz, he finds a personal friendship or more with Valeska von Eichen. In Würzburg, there were no real per personal relations. He only writes about meeting with the American a few times. His viewing angle is similar from a distance as a writer, as well as as a photographer. This relates to his shyness as a performing artist. So more of a comment. I, I think that a lot of shy people are drawn to photography, especially shy people who have an artistic tendency. But I think there's also with that a sense of guilt. Um, you know, that Singh noticed that when he took photographs of the islanders, it induced a kind of self-consciousness in them. They began to pose, you know. They would like appear beside the fireplace with two fingers stuck into the cheek, the way people did in the early photographs. And he was slightly worried about that. And this is a theme in, 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 in um, The Well of the Saints, that play, that one of the corrupting effects of the artist is he makes everyone think of nothing but how they look in the face. <laughs> so there's this kind of enabling element of the art emblematized in photography that's also disabling. Could I make a remark briefly? Uh, yes. <laughs> Sorry, Don't Rim, Rim, take care. Just thank you very much to Catherine and to Declan for their presentations here. I think one thing which uh, the Iron Island experience had for Singh was a liberation from the judgmental nature of his middle class background. Because the Iron Island, certainly in Ishman, is, a, is the nearest thing to a classless society you can get to. Across the country. Sorry. I, I have another, I, I don't know if you're finished. I have a quick question, Candice, if I can put in. Uh, uh, sorry. Declan and Catherine, thanks a million. I, I just want to follow up on, on uh, something you said there, Declan. What about, um, what about the portrayal of women in the Playboy? Like, so you said, so shy was a very, Singh was a very shy man. And uh, the last thing you mentioned was he felt that at the end of his life, he, um, he had adopted feminist, pro-feminist views, if yeah. I'm taking you correctly. So then what about the portrayal of uh, the women, of women? So we have the widow Quinn, who is a, 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 a comical figure, but also portrayed as a sharp, manipulative, powerful in her own way sort of woman. And then of course there is um, the main female character whose name escapes me now. Someone can- Peggy. Peggy, Peggy Mike. Peggy Mike, who's, who in many ways is almost more central to the action. The play begins with her and it ends with her than the playboy himself. So what about these, are these strong characters? Are these feminists? Yeah. I, do they have I, feminists? Do they I, espouse feminist qualities? Yes, I think they are both very strong and in different ways. And they connect to that idea of a strong Celtic womanhood, which was a feature of the Gaelic revival. There were strong women like Emer and Queen Maeve in the stories that were being told again. Um, what's fascinating about the widow Quinn is, yes, she's manipulative, Yes, she's older. Um, she is what would be called in current parlance a cougar, but she, she, <laughs> she also likes him. And uh, th there was a, a, a version of the plot in which Singh thought of marrying Christie to the widow Quinn in a happy kind of way. So really you have the play as just different kinds of studies in types of the strong woman. 
And it's fascinating that Molly Allgood, the actress who was Singh's girlfriend and who played Peggy, uh, would be another of those versions. Singh actually said to her in a letter that they would write a play together and Molly would write all the male parts and he would write all the female ones. And uh, I, I think in a way, this is another form of translation. You, and, 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 and Christie becomes a mighty man through the power of his own lies, his own translations. But they are strong women too, you're right. But I, I think that Singh's attitude to them is warm and positive and celebratory. Yeah, if I can just say, I think, you know, on, on, on Peggy, um, certainly at the start of the play, um, you know, her prospects are fairly slim and Singh draws her attention to the kind of bounded locale that she is inhabiting and um, the lack of opportunity for her. Her only opportunity is to marry uh, Shaneen, and who is, you know, a, a weak and... Um, in many ways, a feminist kind of uh, character, and uh, you know, she she kind of gathers strength through her interactions with um, Christie, and we, or at least her strength is exposed through those interactions. Um, and she comes out. Um, obviously, she's a stronger character. However, she is she has lost the only playboy in the Western world, and we feel uh, sad for her in the end because she is she's going to remain in that um, bounded locale and without opportunities. So I think it's more of a critique on society um, and how and the treatment of women um, in that respect. So was that was that controversial in your opinion at the time? Or a source of controversy, these characters, these female characters? Or I was think it more? The controversy around um, Playboy and Declan can speak more to this as well, but um, I suppose there there was um, a precedent set with Shadow of the Glen, which was a play in which um, a character named Nora left her husband and went wandering the, the, the world with a tramp figure. And, you know, it was felt by certain cultural nationalists at the time that this was not a good representation of Irish womanhood, that a woman would not leave her husband and go uh, traveling the countryside with a, a tramp figure. Um, and, you know, the character was named Nora very pointedly, pointing to Ibsen um, and uh, to, to, to uh, a doll's house and, and the Ibsenite character that leaves her husband. Um, and that's, that was the Ibsenite propaganda that I mentioned previously. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that then created a tone um, in which Playboy the Western World was received um, and, and people were kind of expecting uh, to see a slander on Irish womanhood and once the there were various reasons I suppose for the for the Playboy riots but um, notably the the riots erupted at the word shift referring to a, an under a lady's undergarment and it was felt that you know this wasn't a, a suitable depiction of Irish womanhood um, but that's not to say it wasn't feminist. I, just as a quick footnote Catherine I, I think um, the women in the play, the main women, have a somewhat manly streak, um, uh, masculine almost, and the men, a feminine one. You said that Sean Kyo was effeminate, but Christy is too. And it becomes a kind of turn on for the girls, his tiny feet, which they marvel at. They almost become foot fetishists. And when they catch him preening himself in the mirror, they say, them that kills their fathers is a vain lot, surely. But it's as if Singh is doing all this gender bending. He's making a hero tale that has some basis in the Ku Cullen story. But he's saying, look, the men are all womanly and the women are all manly. I think that's what in some ways precipitated the rioting. The audience was 90% male. They were very committed to a heroic notion of an Irish manhood that would one day rise against the British. And this was more than they could bear because the feeling of masculinity is less strong in males than the feeling of femininity in women. So he really was, as Catherine says, he was challenging very traditional notions of Irish womanhood, but also very traditional notions of just gender more generally. That's interesting. That, thank, thanks guys, that, that, that's interesting. So it sounds like it, it was, a, it, it, he basically anticipated this when provoked this sort of response 
um, challenging both gender stereotypes. I'd actually forgotten about that play uh, the, the one set in the Wickham Mountains, but um, I found that very interesting. Just maybe, I don't know if anyone else has a question. I don't want to hog the meeting. I think, did Raymond have a question? Okay. Earlier? Can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me now? Oh, sorry. Okay. I just wanted to say to uh, thank you both, uh, Catherine and Declan, for the excellent presentations. That I think one of the things about the Iron Islands, particularly the centre one in Ishman, is that it's the nearest thing to a classless society you can get in Ireland. So it had a very liberating effect on Singh personally to escape the judgmental background of, of his middle class background, this judgmental nature of it. And that, I'm sure, added to uh, you know the freedom then, his artistic freedom, which he experienced then after the Iron Island sojourn. Um, but one thing too about the gender bending, well not gender bending, but uh, the reaction of the audience, the 90% male audience to the play, is that um, it could very well be the 19th century male Irishmen had adopted English mores about how women's position in the home and man's position, men's position in society in general, external to the home. And that was something which comes up then through into the revolutionary period as well too, where the women insist on having their own role to play in that. And some of the men had difficulties in accepting that. Something comes across very well in Roy Foster's work on the women of the revolutionary period. So there may be a, a process going on there, a subliminal, a, a sort of a subconscious, a subliminal process among male men at that time to accept more, a more, um, fourth right position for women in Irish society. Yeah, I think that's true. And um, it's connected in one way with the rediscovery of all those strong Celtic women I was talking mm -hmm. about from the saga. But why do they suddenly get rediscovered? I think it's partly to do with the fact that males in the rural society have become exhausted by the struggle to extract a living from very unpromising land and in very arduous economic conditions. And I remember Brennan Kennelly once said to me that he thought a lot of women in rural Ireland did have a greater freedom to elaborate a personality than the men did. Because as he said to me, the men were knackered, right. absolutely exhausted. Mm -hmm. That would be an interesting psychological explanation of all that. Right. And they didn't, of course, have the, uh, you know, the dominant position, which they would have had if they were in middle class England, for example, where there would be a natural position for them to adopt and where they would be able to provide for their families and provide wealth and, uh, for their families. They couldn't do that in rural Ireland because that wasn't possible. No. So they were robbed, if you like, of their traditional role. And there wasn't as strong a sense of social class. Um, uh, right. uh, um, some... Tom, Tom Flanagan once joked that the Brits have a class system and all their culture is based on the internal differences, comedies, tragedies, etc. He said the Americans are worse, they have a class system and they pretend it doesn't exist because they're all Democrats. But he said, you Irish are the worst of all. You have a class <laughs> system and you will not tell anyone what it is. Yes, indeed. And I think Singh was aware that there were hidden injuries of class which he was trying to escape but they had to do with the Anglo-Irish. Thank you. We have a couple more questions and comments uh, in the chat. Uh, from John Lynham uh, from the General Consulate in Frankfurt. A uh, recent article in the Irish Times indicated that despite many books, there is more to be revealed still about the writer. Could you give uh, us a sense of what might remain to be revealed or researched? Are there any leads here in Europe, for example, that we as diplomatic missions can look to assist with or encourage our contacts to look at, given our proximity to the cities where he spent significant amounts of time? But I think Catherine is the person to answer that because she has written a great unpublished book, especially about the French elements in Singh but the German, Italian, other ones you could go on to easily, couldn't you? Yeah, I, to be honest, um, as you may have uh, detected from my pronunciation of uh, German names, <laughs> um, I don't speak German. So um, I, I, I was a student of French, so that drew, drew me to um, his, his French experiences in the first place. And then once I uh, became invested in those, I figured I, I should also uh, look at the German case, but um, unfortunately I don't have the language skills. Um, so there, there probably is a lot for uh, somebody with the language skills to, to look at. Um, 
I, you know, John asked me this uh, before and um, I was trying to, to rack my brain to think, um, you know, who, who else was he um, friendly with? I think there was a Frau Susser um, in, in, I think it was in Oberwerther Würzburg, but um, there are various other people I think that you could maybe follow up on and uh, find out the, uh, a bit more about the links between them. Um, and also the Von Eichen sisters, you know, there's not very much that we know. We know it was a, a, a guest house that they ran um, and uh, I think there, there was prom it was promptly women who they they boarded who boarded there um but i don't i can't think off the top of my head if there's there's an archive in particular that um one should look at but um i'm sure there's there's definitely more work to be done i also think um and this was something that was pointed out to me um by my uh, external examiner actually is that you know we often we think of seeing very much so in a, in an Irish context or in a European, if we think a bit more about that aspect. Um, but we rarely think about the Eng his English experience and his um, setting him within kind of an English context as uh, our British context as well. Um, given, I suppose, that he was part of a cultural nationalist um, movement, um, that kind of um, shifts the emphasis, I suppose. Um, but perhaps there is more to find out about his the time that he spent um, in, in London and his relationship with his cousin, who was a, an etcher. Um, uh, I can't remember his, his name. Do you remember, Declan? The, the cousin in London. Um, I can't remember his name, but I think there's, there's perhaps some more to be done on the, um, his English. Um, experiences. Um, there's a request, a sort of general request from Mary Rose. Um, to, she'd like to hear more about female sexuality in J.M. Singh's work, if possible. Is that possible? Well, go on, Catherine. Um, well, I suppose, you know, um, in the Aran Islands, um, he was very attentive to um, the, the, I suppose, again, like I mentioned before, um, there are different ways of looking at the primitive that emerge at this time. There's the kind of more uh, romantic mode, which um, is idealized, idealizes folk subjects, similar to what he was doing in Germany, where he kind of idealizes this cottage girl in his plan for a play. Um, and you symbol for for him in that plan for a play. So she symbolizes kind of a, a return to a, an authentic past. Or there now there's developing this modernist mode, um, which is more attentive to the brutal and the sexual kind of elements of life. And I think on the Iron Islands in particular, he was very um, attentive to the connection between the islanders and nature and the environment and the elements. Um, in contrast to modern society that, um, you know, technology had kind of cut them off from, from that. And, you know, that's something that we are still attentive to today and deal with in, in various ways. Um, and that was also connected to the anarchist kind of impulses that he viewed on, on Aran Islands as well. Um, but certainly I think on the Aran Islands, you know, you can see through um, his writing that um, his lens was, um, I suppose, inflected by um, the feminist readings that he, he would have, um, and, and feminist kind of discussions that he would have been part of in, in Paris. And that's where he, to my knowledge, at least, um, he was first in, introduced to um, feminism. And, and there were women in the French commune of the 1870s who dressed in male clothing sometimes to escape the authorities, but it's it's just an interesting thing. The gender bending that exists in Singh's place seems to go back to that too. Uh, I think he was very interested in androgyny and probably all artists are, because if you're a male artist, it's the act of creation is in some way connecting with the muse, the anima, as Jung would say, the feminine element in yourself. And likewise for a woman artist, she's, liberating the animus. And I think Singh and Yeats were both deeply aware of this and it, it informed their view of gender and of the way ordinary people are, not just artists. 
Thank you. Uh, we're going to just take one more question. I was sent this in a di direct message. It's from Thomas. Um, so very interesting to hear that Singh wrote quite a bit about the links between Irish, especially Munster Irish and words on the continent, Garçon, Garçon. Uh, does Declan have any ideas or thoughts as to why Singh didn't follow through with this? Uh, was it his shyness, his being Bagonin Kutalak, <laughs> or the literary circles and their personae in Ireland in which he moved? As an example, it is quite strange that Yates advised Singh to travel to the Aran Islands, yet he, Yates, steadfastly refused absolutely to engage in anything other than through the English language. Well, Yates tried on 13 separate occasions to learn Irish and failed dismally. He was a monoglot, Yates. He couldn't learn any language. And some people say even his English was incomplete. I mean, when he, spe when he applied for the professorship in Trinity, he couldn't spell the word professor. <laughs> um, so he was very different in that way. Um, the reason I think Singh didn't develop that is because, as I say, he was an artist rather than a scholar. But people who've done dialect studies since then have commented on all these similarities between the Munster dialect of Irish and elements of the French language. And equally, you know, the Irish spoken in Donegal is often compared with Scots Gaelic, um, uh, you know, to the point where, you know, when, when Radio na Gaeltacht started off in the 1970s, people in Munster, if they were listening to a newsreader from Donegal reading the news, they often found it hard to understand. Now, the dialects have converged a bit, partly as a result of the electronic media but they were almost like separate languages, even in my youth. And how much more so would that have been true in Singh's day? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you everybody for posing questions um, tonight. Uh, and thank you Declan and Catherine again for answering them and for delivering such great um, presentations. Um, just before we break out into the little breakout rooms, um, breakout, uh, I, I'm going to hand over to um, Consul General in Frankfurt, John Lynham, to say a few words. John. Uh, thank you, Candice. And uh, of course, I'd like to echo uh, your thanks to our esteemed speakers, uh, Professor Kybert and uh, Dr. Wilson for really fascinating lectures. Um, I don't know uh, about everybody else, but I was taking notes uh, like a good student back, uh, well, the good student that I should have been when I was at school studying uh, thing. Um, but uh, it is fascinating. Um, and to, to think that uh, he spent time in um, places that we are discovering here as part of our consular work um, in, in, uh, in Rheinland-Pfalz, uh, which of course wasn't Rheinland-Pfalz back, back then, but uh, has been since uh, the uh, the um, 40s and um, the late 40s um yes they really uh, the, the the lectures really illuminated i think the work of of singh um, and the importance of his travels in germany and elsewhere in, in europe and i hope it was the same experience for the audience and i'm quite sure it was judging by the excellent uh, and interesting questions um, for me, I, I thought Catherine's reference to, um, you know, German uh, was, was really interesting in the psychological space that it created because we here uh, in, in Germany or the Irish here in, in Germany in our two missions, of course, are always working on our German language skills and kind of speculate about the effect it has on us um, because it's, it's a constant uh, struggle, <laughs> it, uh, certainly for me anyway. Um, but yeah, and then Declan's references, of course, to the Aran Islands have created, I think, a longing among all of us um, to travel again to the west of Ireland. Um, and, and that's something that hopefully we can do in the not too distant future. Of course, thank you to Ambassador O'Brien for his opening remarks and also for inviting us here in the consulate to participate in uh, the first inaugural Culture Salon. Um, it's been a great start to the series. And of course, we in the consulate do look forward to contributing um, further again um, as, as, as it develops. 
Um, Catherine um, did, uh, of course, show us wonderful pictures of Koblenz and, and Bingen, um, and I strongly encourage people who do come to this region to visit them. Uh, they really are very scenic um, and just a short day trip from Frankfurt. Uh, we will go to Koblenz and meet Irish citizens as well living in that area. Um, in fact, one, one of the Irish citizens living beside Koblenz is actually the mayor of a small town uh, called Dausenau. Um, but we will encourage them to, to build on this event and to, I suppose, ensure that uh, things links with this part of Germany are better known and understood. Um, some of the later writers, of course, uh, who had been uh, influenced by Singh, Of Samuel Beckett, who was a frequent visitor to Castle, which is just about an hour north of Frankfurt, and uh, you know we'll we'll work also to build uh, those those links, especially because Frankfurt is a, a centre of the global book trade uh, with the annual uh, book festival uh, or book fair, uh, which we hope again comes back uh, in the near future in its physical form. So yeah, just as we as we get ready to go into the breakout rooms. Um, Thank you for joining us uh, for this evening to, to, to all of the participants um, and, and, and the audience and to encourage you to attend in the future. Um, we do also have book clubs in the embassy and the consulate uh, and you know we have some coming up um, very soon so keep an eye on our social media for details and the next culture salon will be on May the 12th. Candice will have the details. And uh, finally, from my side, just to thank Candice, Niall, Milena, and all those at the embassy um, for making this wonderful evening possible. So, vielen Dank and schönen Abend, and uh, over to Candice. Thank you so much, John. Uh, yes, as John said, the next Culture Salon will be in on the 12th of April. It's uh, something quite different as we have um, artist Alina Egan giving an exhibition tour of her exhibition, which is taking place soon in Kunsthaus Bremen, uh, along with her, uh, with the curator, Melissa Canvas. Um, so very much a salon focused on contemporary visual arts. Um, we'd be delighted if you could join us for that. Um, and then there will be, of course, further uh, events uh, for our, our Sing uh, 150 season as well, coming up in the future. If you don't already subscribe to the uh, the Monas book, I recommend that you do so that you can keep up with the events that we have coming up. Um, and yes, uh, to echo um, what John said, uh, thank you so much to Milena, Niall, um, to Thomas and uh, the ambassador, of course, um, for everything for tonight's event. And of course, thank you, Declan and Catherine for just um, set, setting off the Culture Salon with such a, uh, to such a high standard. So thank you so much.